have you with us. Very glad to have you with us here today in this digital space. Um, I, I believe you should have a poll popping up uh, quite soon on your screen. We would like to ask you uh, about your expectations for the day to, uh, to make sure that we are in touch with who our audience is. So if you could quickly just, uh, answer the question there, then we'll get started. Wonderful. So we have some results coming in now. Um, I think I can at least see the results. I hope everyone else can. Um, the quote is, what are you most excited to learn about today? And it seems like our answers are, uh, are quite lit, honestly, with most people saying tactical examples to engage the community. Uh, but quite a few were after that with ways to facilitate cooperation. And then finally, roles to frame a placemaking project for financial sustainability. Um, we're quite excited today because I think we'll be covering all of these things. Um, thanks for your participation there. Um, uh, to emphasize once again, uh, this is the Place Sit Symposium in Oslo. Um, this is day one of the symposium on sustainable placemaking models, um, and it is being put on by Nabilag Sager, who is a partner in the Place City Project, with support from Placemaking Europe and its partners. We want to welcome everyone today uh, joining us uh, online from all over Europe, uh, as well as some, some folks from North America as well. I think we have uh, participants today from Canada, the US, Spain, Norway, Austria, Scotland, all over. Uh, so very glad that we can all be together today in this space. My name is Adam Curtis. Um, I'm going to be the host today of the Place City Symposium in Oslo. Um, I am the CEO of Nabolag Sager. Uh, we think and do tank, and we work with social aspects of sustainable development here in Oslo uh, and are very excited to be a part of the Place City Project, um, which we will hear more about uh, in the coming minutes. I am going to share my screen rather quickly to get things started. Yep. Just to give everyone a brief introduction, uh, Place City is a joint uh, program initiative of the European Union um, that aims to increase uh, the economic potential of placemaking as well as deepen the methodology of placemaking uh, within Europe. It focuses heavily on Oslo and Vienna as case studies, uh, and it is supported by JPI Urban Europe, the Research Council of Norway, the Federal Ministry of Transport Innovation Technology in Vienna, Austria, uh, as well as the Savings Bank Foundation of uh, the Norwegian Bank and the Urban Renewal Program of Grönland and Toyen in Oslo. Uh, partners of the Place C project uh, include the city of Vienna, the city of Oslo, uh, Eutropium, Suvine Urbanism, University of Applied Arts, Vienna Social Design, Steep, Nabelagshager, Bids Belgium, and Place Making Europe. Once again, Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, I would like to invite everyone to ask questions in the chat through the conference. 
uh, we'll be visiting those questions towards the end of our time together today. Uh, so feel free as things come to mind to just stick them there in the chat and we'll be curating that. Um, but also like to mention that this, this symposium today is being recorded um, and that it is streaming live on Facebook as we speak. So hi to all of our viewers over on Facebook as well. Uh, now I have the fine pleasure of introducing Bonanor Nysa, uh, who is an architect and film producer at Atropian and Place City Project Coordinator. Uh, she's going to share a little bit with us about the Place City Jet. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Our last Play City conference now streaming from Oslo, but uniting is us from various places in Europe and the, the American states. I assume we have also some Spanish speaking countries or people uh, from the southern parts, not only the US and Canada. Um, it's a pleasure to have you because we have experience uh, quite a journey in the last two years, two and a half years actually. And um, I would like to share with you how things uh, evolved um, in the in the last two years. Um, Adam introduced you already to the partners, but the partners are great but the single people's efforts was so meaningful and no matter how big the challenges were, the, the effort on and the experience of single people's um, uh, lives and contribution and dedication to the project, to, to the public life uh, was so significant, especially when we faced uh, COVID-19. We knew nothing. We didn't know what to expect in the upcoming months. Uh, we knew we have to finish this project. We want to pre uh, finish this project. We want to have uh, an impact, but we didn't know how. And I think um, for all the projects which are running right now, but for us, uh, it was a turning point to think twice, but also act very quickly. I would really like you to honor those people who contributed so much, no matter if it's Ina from the uh, city of Vienna or um, Niels, who was intern uh, at the city of Vienna or people coming and going, but everyone left their traces and contributed with their full heart for with their full imagination to the success of the project. And what was our aim? Our aim was to bring people together through placemaking to improve together places in Oslo and Vienna. And while doing so, write down how we did this, collect tools, collect stories, collect activities, and share it with everyone. And create, in a way, a new or the placemaking network already exists, of course, but to support its growth in Europe and bring people together. In Europe, maybe it's different than the US and Canada. English is not the mother tongue for many people. So placemaking, even though it was happening, it was in many places not visible or not titled or named as placemaking. So this project brought gave us the opportunity to bring things together name it, frame it, and collect it in a place, in a platform, uh, so it's um, available for everyone. And as that, we wanted to be now in a placemaking week to meet you, to talk to you, to share with you, as we did in Valencia in 2019. But COVID came and we had to react, we had to engage, we had to exchange, we had to share. And we had to also look to other colleagues, other projects, how do they deal with the situation? What are the risks? Is it only us who are dealing and having these, these issues? So we started last year with, the, with a series of um, webinars, which were called Cooperative City in Quarantine. We were in quarantine, but we thought 
since the digital possibilities are still given, we can still uh, unite, we can still show solidarity. And there were numerous episodes which are very relevant for placemaking activities, but two especially, which was uh, which were dealing about public life and social coherence, because these two topics are so relevant for placemaking, especially during COVID, but also after COVID. We learned so much. We can't relate on our um, traditional systems that they take care of our places, of, of our well-being in the city, if things like COVID or other restrictions, that might be a co economic crisis, it doesn't have to be always health crisis, come uh, around the corner, we will always be challenged. Therefore, there are certain topics where we have to pay attention, be more precise, be very, very fast in finding solutions with placemaking to react because placemaking is all about making things better for everyone. And we have to be very clear on what values we want to um, create and what values we want to uh, support. Last year at the same time, uh, we had a Play City conference. That time it was uh, um, made by Supervin, who is host, uh, one of the speakers today. And we had the chance to speak to placemakers from all around the world. And we had the clear vision, we can react and deal with COVID no matter we are, where we are. We have maybe different legislation, different even uh, democratic systems, Maybe financial situation is different, but we can do it together and we should look to each other and understand how can we translate those positive examples to our context. One more thing is also very important in terms of COVID or any kind of uh, special challenges or crises. When there are examples which are promising, we should make our best to share, to promote, and so on. Um, Roland brought us last year on a walk in Vienna and showed us all the responses to COVID within the city. And our question was, why can't it stay like that? Because in times of crisis, we learn what is really important for us, for our social life. And that was mobility access place where people can be it was not about traffic it was not about money it was not about advertisement it was about people's first and most deep needs and if you have place places like that where you think this intervention this example is really really good and should be shared make walks make stories make films about it write about it make pictures about it, share it with the world, because those people who do that, they need the support. All the impressions, all the projects we collected over the first lockdown of last year, we um, brought them together in a manifesto. And this manifesto has the people as a center, not the the regulations, not the laws, but the people, because the needs of the people do not change too much. We want connection with others. We want a meaning for our life. We want places to be. We want places to act and feel free. And this has to be the core for all post-COVID cities. And therefore, the manifesto is open for everyone you can download it, you can use it as a guide for your project, for your planning or for your designing. It's available for everyone. And we would be obviously also very happy to get feedback to improve it better, make it better, and probably to act together to create those postcode cities collectively. In fall, we started to collect and open up more and systematically um, understand what are 
our colleagues doing around the world. So we started collecting, uh, for, in for instance, winter place making uh, examples or pandemic examples. There will be more calls to come. But important is for us that we have a collection of examples, how we can de deal with challenges and that can improve our work so much more in local context. We also uh, organized placemaking pills where people had the chance to speak and to explain what they were doing, how they were reacting to challenges, how they were bringing people together or how they were creating meaning and value for places. This is actually a placemaking tool and also available for everyone to use and organize in all contexts. So if you think in your community, in your town, in your village, maybe also your city, you would like to bring all those people together who do great work, then just use the placemaking pills and give everyone the voice to present their work. In within the placemaking a network, we also have created a, a big bigger place for everyone who wants to connect in certain topics. For instance, um, if you like to work with kids or your projects are about designing better places for kids, the placemaking for kids uh, working group might be the right one. So you just join the working group and meet regularly you present your work you co-organize uh, co events perhaps apply for funding uh, create projects together there is no limit in 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 imagining you can do all that we have already 14 uh, working groups but you can also initiate your own working group within the placemaking europe network Next to exchange, we feel like we have to connect with certain peers like European uh, Knowledge Network and other institutions and networks in Europe to make the transition possible. So we started um, a new um, webinar or dialogue series uh, where we had last uh, just 10 days ago an event where we talked about how can we do the transition on a uh, street level with all the experience, with all the examples, with all the crisis happening recently? What can we learn from that? And where do we have to put our focus on? We also collected a lot of tools uh, in these two years. We developed them in a way that they should act as a manual for you. So you can just simply go on the placemaking website and look for the right tool for you. It might be a process where you need um, some ideas how to engage with uh, citizens or with stakeholders, or um, you have a certain topic like climate or like um, water, and then you find all the tools which are relevant for uh, this certain idea. We try also to publish and make, uh, make the content more useful for you so you have a documentation in your hand but the the placemaking toolbox is made for you to to explore more without being um, uh, limited to a publication we also would like to uh, invite you and to explore all the activities everyone being part of the placemaking network can publish events, activities, invite people through the network, but also they can publish their stories. How did things go for you in your special context, with your special uh, stakeholder constellation, with uh, your special needs, for instance, and frameworks, financial, legal, and so on. Those stories are very important for a lot of people to understand how they, how can they utilize the tools, the methods in their context and make it work? Where do they have to pay attention to, for instance? And to engage with you all, especially in Facebook, Instagram, and all other social media, we invited throughout the two and a half years, everyone to 
use the hashtag place city whenever they feel like this is a place we should see. We got places from ice skating or trees. And I think the the one uh, one definition of the place is always part of the story is very right, is totally correct. I can um, sign this, but I believe you are also a part of this story and we can manage the transition only if we work together, if we learn from each other and if we act together. Thank you very much. This is my yes. contribution. Thanks so much, Bonanor. And also thank you for your leadership throughout the Place City project. We're very, a, very glad to have worked with you. It um, was a pleasure throughout the two and a half years for me. Thank you for being with me. Yeah. Um, I would like to now introduce uh, Roland Krebs, uh, who is an urban planner and director at Supervene Urbanism. Uh, Roland is going to present to us the Vienna case study of the Place City project. I'll hand it to Roland. Thanks, Evan. Um, I need the host to share my screen, please. Can someone give me the host? You're gonna get be hosted in one second. Yeah. Actually, we're at home. My kid is sick, and it there might be a noise. So that's a typical pandemic situation at home. I don't have it. Host disabled. Yes, host. Yes. Perfect. Great. So I'm sharing the screen. So. So, Place City Floridsdorf, right? That's. See my screen? Yes, great. So, um, thanks for for invitation. Uh, that has been quite a ride uh, for us uh, between go, no go, stop, uh, rethink the project, rethink the tools, rethink the everything. Um, so we had a quite good start beginning uh, and it was a, a complete uh, disaster in the middle. And now we are, I think we have a very good ending um, and we learned a lot from that. Um, and, but let me, let me make a, a, little big, a, bit, a little bit of a background of placemaking in Vienna. Uh, that is uh, that is not new for us uh, because Vienna is using the placemaking um, uh, in, in in a lot of situations uh, since uh, maybe fifteen years ago, and uh, we defined for us uh, a, a definition of placemaking, uh, but because it was not clear for all of us, what is it? And uh, for for us, placemaking is a method to transform a play a space into a place. And uh, public space is being activated and made more attractive for and through the local residents, activists, artists, and entrepreneurs. So that's that's very important for us. Uh, that it's not uh, that these are not traveling ideas that we see from other countries and other other places and just uh, implement in our uh, in our context. And there is one project that we learned from, which is the uh, the activation of the Donau Canal. It's the Danube Channel in the, in the heart of the city. Uh, and it's a quite remarkable project by an architect called uh, Gabu Heindl. And she did a, a really unique uh, true placemaking intervention uh, without even knowing it, that we call it now. This is a, a, a zoning for placemaking because this is a, a river channel in the city that has enabling spaces, commercial areas, and recreational areas. And that's uh, quite interesting because that's uh, also where we want to aim with our project. Uh, the, with the dimension of so, uh, sustainability, we want to reach a social uh, balance. We want a cultural impact, economical impact, environmental impact, and we want to have this as a governance structure. And uh, uh, from, from, from the Vienna case that is very successful un until today, we, we thought how could we use placemaking as a planning tool for Vienna, uh, but not in that central areas, but in the districts 
uh, where no hipsters are around, no where uh, universities are, just the normal people how to implement placemaking there. So we, we went over the Danube, uh, not the Danube Channel, the Danube Channel is in the middle of the city, but the Danube, the real blue Danube is just here. Uh, and um, it looks like this. It's, uh, it's a district a little bit of in decay, but also in a, a state of urban re, uh, renewal. It has a very famous market, the Schlinger market. You see the famous social housing from Vienna here from the 1930s and some infrastructure that is not working anymore at all. And uh, our pilot project uh, is, uh, is a pilot project in, the, in, a, in a group of projects, I think that will start now of uh, the regeneration of centralities of Vienna. Um, so the goal of the project was to use placemaking as a tool of urban regeneration, as I said. Um, and uh, in the Vienna case, it was more about the regeneration of uh, historic centralities. So old centralities that are not working uh, now very well or need uh, 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 regeneration. Um, or, and also uh, we wanted to create the methodology and the toolbox as Bahanu said, we wanted to add tools to the, uh, to the bigger framework of the placemaking Europe. Uh, so what we did was uh, we, we implemented a, a kind of a regular planning process uh, that would be usual uh, in Vienna. Um, we, we would have uh, quantitative data analysis, qualitative data analysis with interviews, we would do mapping, but then comes something else with, which is new for us, which is a co-creation phase, uh, which was uh, with free workshops. So it, it, it already had uh, placemaking tools in play uh, uh, being used as the place game and other, other tools that uh, were transferred uh, to us from, from Stipo, from our partners. We also organized forums where we in, uh, invited uh, people from, from, the, from the district uh, to participate in the forums uh, and to, to give feedback. Um, and the goal was, that was before the pandemic, we, uh, we were uh, um, structuring this, this, this input into a framework strategy or in an urban strategy. Uh, we developed development goals, the exact planning areas. And, and so that would be until now would be more or less a dialogue oriented planning process, nothing to do or not so much to do with placemaking, but then comes the testing and activation. And this is also where the, the problem started a little bit uh, with the COVID. And uh, we had to 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 to, to rethink the project again, uh, and uh, yeah, we we had we had different ideas uh, that turned out differently. But I, I can show you what 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 was the result then. But some slides about uh, the progress that we had uh, we had um, analyzed all the stakeholders from the community, private sector, public administration, and the local place makers also. We did. Uh, uh, this quanti quali quantitative analysis of, uh, for example, uh, the the vacancy uh, in in the in yeah. the district in our planning area, which was quite remarkably high, uh, and then we had uh, this this local uh, uh, forums uh, that we organized. Uh, also, we had film screenings, uh, so we we had a place making pills. We had a lot of different engagement. Um, uh, tools. Uh, this is one of these um, events. We had uh, around 20 to 30 people in it by average, uh, and it was co creatively organ um, developed uh, a vision and the goals and uh, the so called enabling spaces. So we said, okay, when if we want to transfor uh, uh, transform this area into a into a better place, a more activated place, more for people, we have to find the spots where we can actually work on. And the, the spots that we, we identified in this, in, this, in this area are these spots that are here uh, um, marked in this, in this map. So this was our action area uh, that we activated uh, through 
some some of the activities of the of the university for example the our partner the the uh, the university of Appli applied arts uh, they rented a, a vacant area one of the uh, uh, vacant areas and they organized um, um, local local activities and we organized a call um, for 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 these enabling spaces and we asked the people hey where do you want to implement your project and and the project will be implemented in the same areas that I, I showed before that are these enabling spaces so we, we our assumption is if we enable or we activate these these places then we could have a more active uh, district uh, center so these are the, some pictures of this of these enabling spaces uh, it's a park then there is this uh, parking lot uh, in front of the market then there is one of these uh, connecting corridors or streets. Then there is a newly developed or designed park or plaza, which is totally empty uh, most of the of the time. Uh, then there is the the, the, the district mayor uh, has also a little spot there, and uh, Franz Jonas Platz is is a train station uh, that is um, the welcome welcoming area of this. Uh, of this area um, and so the result is that we did a cultural program uh, through that started uh, two weeks ago and that will run until summer and even even longer because we developed a tool uh, it is called the florum uh, the florum is a is a is a multi um, uh, how you say multi a um, uh, multi-dimensional uh, tool that you can use uh, for uh, showing a, a movie, to have uh, um, uh, an event, uh, to have to have uh, uh, music, uh, a children's workshop, and uh, uh, um, a bookshelf. Because uh, a bookshelf is a quite important uh, uh, word here, because the, this florum was submitted to the local library that is actually in the heart of the whole project. And we identified them as, as potential owners of this, of this tool that everybody can actually use it. Uh, here we are with the district mayor at our presentation of the tool and the program. Uh, you see it's a very smart and uh, small um, uh, device that, that can be moved anywhere and uh, where, where, where people can organize their own herbs uh, workshop uh, in the in the area. Um, so we have to understand there is hardly any seating, there is hardly any places where you can uh, be active in the district. And this is one of these enabling spaces that, that, that we identified and that could be activated throughout this, this program. And as Bahanur told us before, this is not only this local program that we, we, we tried to activate, uh, or we are we're aiming to activate Floridsdorf uh, and the district of Floridsdorf, we created also these tools for our toolbox of um, um, place, place making Europe. And this is one of the manuals that uh, we are feeding into this, um, uh, um, uh, into this toolbox. Um, for example, the call of ideas so the people actually submitted their, 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 their ideas and these were regular people. These are not, not even uh, like built interventions, but a lot of um, events. Yeah? Uh, and, and that's why we, we built this tool to facilitate these events. And the call of ideas is, is one of the tools that we submitted. And the other tool was the Florum itself. The Florum is this uh, forum uh, as a multifunctional device that um, yeah that uh, that facilitates the um, the activation of of fluoride stuff. Yeah, that's from Vienna. Uh, our case study. Uh, yeah, we were very happy to be part of the project. Uh, and uh, yeah, I give the word back to Adam. Yeah, thanks so much, Roland. Um, it was really nice to follow the Vienna project over the past two and a half years and learn from Vienna here in Oslo. Um, so to shift things a bit, uh, we're now going to hear from the Oslo case study, 
of Place City. And for that, uh, we're going to hand it to Laura Martinez, my colleague at Nabelag Sagar, who is the director of research and has been managing the Place City project for Nabelag Sagar in Oslo. Thank you, Alam. I will share them. So, yes, so my, my name is uh, Laura Martinez, and today I will like to share with you our main activities and uh, the main tools, uh, placemaking tools we actually have developed under uh, our Place City case study in, in Oslo. The main Place City partners in Norway are the Agency for Urban Environment and uh, Nabola Sager. However, we have of course, uh, create uh, partnership and relationships with many other uh, key stakeholders during, uh, during our, our project. This is our um, project area. It's called uh, Harsh Lab High School, uh, and it's located in, in Grönland, one of the most multicultural and colorful and vibrant areas of Oslo. However, this area has also uh, the highest proportion uh, in the country of young people that are pessimistic about their future. Also, one third of youth do not complete high school, and 25% of youth believe they will become unemployed. This is really, uh, really sad. That's why in 2018, uh, we decided to establish a partnership with Harslab High School. And through our Oslo Living Lab Youth uh, Program, we have been creating meaningful jobs for uh, students that attend uh, this school. And since then, our main goal, um, uh, it has been, of course, to empower youth from the school, but also youth uh, uh, from this neighborhood, and also facilitate that the students uh, create inclusive activities and meeting places in their school yards, both for fellow students, but also for the local community around, around the, the school. You can see they are pretty lucky. They have an amazing school yard. It's almost 6,000 uh, 6, square meters with a wonderful garden. So, so they, there is a lot of potential uh, there. Now I will give you a brief uh, overview of our planning process and timeline for the project. We started in May 2019 uh, with, a research, uh, with our research phase. During this phase, we actually established a youth research team who collect uh, different type of qualitative and quantitative data about the area, about uh, how people use the space, about the organizations and uh, local businesses uh, around the uh, school as well. Um, and they uh, were very active identifying issues, needs, and uh, wishes for the area. So in, uh, they basically uh, had a lot of uh, conversations with uh, fellow students, with teachers, social workers, and, and, and neighbors uh, as well. This was great to have, to have it as a base uh, for, uh, for the, the implementation phase uh, later on. Right after our research phase, we start with a co-creation uh, uh, phase where we um, organize many different workshops together with, with the youth uh, to come up basically with more concrete ideas on how um, their school yard could be improved, but also what type of activities they would like to um, have uh, uh, after school hours. Um, after school hours, for example, no. So, so all that were uh, were uh, was the main focus of of this co-creation uh, phase. After that, we collect all the ideas and uh, and, and plan um, our implementation phase together with uh, the school uh, administration and also, of course, together with with the youth. And then we develop um, our implementation phase where we test 
many different fun, uh, quick, light, uh, cheap ideas and short-term experiments, uh, basically to, to transform the school year pretty quickly um, to show the potential of things that can be done uh, in the school year and bring energy and life also into that space pretty quickly. Uh, I think uh, it's pretty important to do it uh, uh, quite quickly after the research and the co-creation phase. So all the people that are involved on those, uh, on those phases can actually see pretty quick uh, some uh, implementation and interventions in, in the area. And currently we are now in the, in the um, project evaluation and, and recommendation uh, phase where we are uh, identifying uh, failures and uh, barriers uh, from our project, but also identifying uh, key stakeholders that play a really important uh, role in our project and developing recommendations for, for policy creation. So that is something we are working right, right now. I would like to share together with you uh, all of our uh, amazing <laughs> tactical uh, activities that we uh, uh, organize uh, together with uh, our uh, youth and students from the school uh, in order to engage also um, the local, local community. So I'm happy, I was very happy to see that many of you were really interested uh, in that topic because I will present you different activities that we had uh, during the two years and a half uh, of this project, but also all the tools that we use um, and also the different placemaking tools that we develop as well during, during this project. So um, as I mentioned, we started in 2019 with uh, our research phase. Uh, the youth was uh, very, uh, very involved in this in this phase uh, because we really wanted to identify you now what what are the needs uh, for this area, what youth want uh, in, in their school year, but also, of course, uh, we wanted to know what teachers and uh, and and neighbors in the area also wanted to to do with, with the school yard, because I, I think it's important to mention that the school yard is actually a public space. So people are welcome to use this area after school hours and in weekends, but um, pretty often the area is quite empty. No one really used this, this space. So we really also want, we really wanted to hear uh, from the neighbors, no? how can we make this uh, place more welcoming? And uh, yeah, so, so I, this is just a couple of examples of the tools that uh, our youth research, our uh, youth um, research team use. Uh, the first one is called Place Game, and the second one is the City at the Eye Level. They are pretty uh, easy uh, tools to kind of like initiate the placemaking uh, process. So I really recommend you to download both uh, tools from the Placemaking Europe uh, webpage and take a look and test these tools as well in your, in your communities. Uh, we also have uh, several co-creation workshops with, uh, with uh, the youth from uh, our youth program, Oslo Living Lab, but also with the students from, from the school. And during this, this uh, um, workshop, we we ask um, youth to come up with concrete ideas, no? Like we didn't want anymore to, to just uh, uh, collect data, but actually we want them to be active, no? In, in, in how we can actually, like in how, how can we make their, their um, the school yard much better. So amazing ideas uh, came up from these, uh, from these workshops. So we again, collect all these ideas uh, and, and, and make our implementation phase uh, based on, on all the feedback and all the, the ideas that we collect during these co-creation workshops. Actually, in one of them, we just basically ask them to draw their, their uh, ideal, how their ideal school year, how this school year 
will look like no if they have the, the availability to really design from scratch uh, their dream uh, school yard. So we come up with some uh, visions for 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 the place. We also uh, organize um, pop up cafes and pop up street parties. These are um, super fun uh, and, uh, and they are a very easy way to engage with your local community. Uh, the feedback from the local community was very, very positive because uh, it's very easy to create a temporary place uh, for people just putting, as you can see in the pictures, uh, some chairs and tables, uh, preparing some nice food, having music. Um, and it is so you create a perfect space where you can talk uh, with neighbors, talk also with your fellow students, talk even with your teachers, and also with people from the school uh, administration, like yeah, high up <laughs> that maybe students normally don't really talk to uh, to them. So this create a very informal space where people can basically mingle and and talk. And for us, it was. Um, really, really good to also get to know um, many of the um, local neighbors that they also would like to, to use the schoolyard um, as well. So we wrote a um, manual. Sorry, here are also other, you see, we have many pictures uh, from uh, our uh, pop-up cafes and the pop-up uh, street uh, parties, you see we managed to gather quite a lot of uh, people and serve some really, really good uh, food. I think that was really important to, to, be, to be very attractive, not to people. When they smell a nice barbecue, everybody, yeah, everybody came uh, and joined us. So we wrote, actually, we wrote a pop-up cafe manual together with uh, Paco Inclan who is the developer of uh, this uh, idea. He has been trying these uh, pop-up cafes in Spain for many years. So he actually came to, to Oslo and uh, helped us to organize the first one. So please, again, if you want to organize a pop-up cafe in your community, you can download the manual as well from Placemaking Europe webpage or also in Nabolas Hager. You can also download the PDF and uh, uh, start your own pop-up cafes <laughs> in your community. Also, um, during the short-term experiments uh, phase or during the implementation phase, we uh, organized together with the youth two temporary light interventions in the schoolyard during winter months. You know, um, winters in Norway are pretty dark. So we wanted to also do different activities uh, during winter. Um, so this was uh, also suggested uh, by some students during the research phase. And that's why we organize uh, these light installations uh, together with uh, some artists from Oslo and also uh, together with um, our youth. And we develop a handbook for making light interventions. So please download it, try again. I think it's a really good way of uh, activate a space, especially in winter when, uh, when days are really short. So I hope you will, you will feel inspired and, and implement uh, some lights installations in, in your cities as, as well. Also something, uh, also something that it was actually identified during the research phase, it was um, the lack of sitting uh, places. Uh, also many students, uh, told us or give, us or give faith, feedback about uh, the lack of colors uh, in the school, school yard is pretty much gray and light red, really like boring colors. So they really wanted to have more colors, more green plants, feel it a little bit more colorful and bright, vibrant. So um, together with uh, some social entrepreneurs from the, from the area, we organize uh, a workshop to build temporary outdoor pop-up furniture for the schoolyard. The youth were involved in every single step of the process. So they plan the, the workshop, 
together with the with the uh, social uh, enterprise they decide the colors of the pop-up furniture they plant uh, the different plants and bushes and everything so so and they are really make really using this this furniture i all the time get pictures from from uh, the teachers in the school um with with the with the students using this this furniture so this is great to that it is great to see that they really um like those uh, pop-up furniture and then yeah i'm about to finish my presentation i uh, hope you felt inspired with uh, some of the things that we did in harsh lab high school and also uh, uh, with this with the different tools that we we develop during the, um, the project. We develop much more, uh, um, many more tools that you can uh, again download in in, uh, in place making uh, Europe and in our web page. Uh, but this is our last, last, last uh, tool or or publication uh, that is called um, Povirk. It's a handbook. Uh, written in collaboration with the student council uh, at Harslab, and the publication provides uh, insights in how high school students um, and also school uh, staff can develop a placemaking process in their school yard. Because uh, we didn't only wanted to uh, empower youth in Harslab, we really wanted to uh, share our experiences and learnings and also failures and barriers and things that we did grow, of course, with other schools. So we um, uh, wrote this uh, handbook uh, and basically the handbook walks you through all the steps uh, of a um, place uh, making process from the research to the funding, developing ideas, communication, evaluation. So again, feel free to download it and uh, dive in, <laughs> in the publication and hopefully and share it, especially share it with maybe with people that you think they could also find it useful. So hopefully more and more uh, youth will uh, become active uh, placemakers in, in their communities. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, Join us in uh, join the placemaking. I just wanted to use this opportunity to tell you to join us uh, to join the placemaking. Sorry, the yeah the placemaking Europe network, um, but also uh, test placemaking tools and share your placemaking tools uh, with us because at least uh, at least in, from my experience it has been really really useful to get access to these uh, manuals and tools in order to plan our activities and also for the youth has been really useful. And uh, we in Abolas Hager are always <laughs> looking for partners to start a new exciting projects. So if you wanna collaborate with us in future uh, projects, contact me uh, at laura at naulashager.no so we can initiate some exciting placemaking projects together. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura, for your presentation and for the inspiration from Oslo. Um, we're going to dive a little deeper now with some guest speakers uh, looking a little deeper into sustainable place making models. Um, so we have four presentations uh, that we will be seeing about 15 minutes each. Um, the first is coming to us from Anna Bradley, who is an urban researcher and a network manager at Stipo in the Netherlands. Um, she's going to share some uh, key research results from these case studies in Vienna and Oslo uh, and give us a little more insight into sustainable placemaking models. So I'll turn it over to Anna now. Super, thank you, Adam. All right, so uh, I'm assuming everybody can see my screen. Thumbs up. Yes, so my name is Anna. I work at Stipo and Placemaking Europe, specifically uh, researching placemaking tools, models, um, and looking to make our cities more livable, sustainable, and lovable. 
So in Place City, we did research all about um, the models behind placemaking. How can we uh, build a stable financial basis for placemaking? Um, not in the goal itself, but to stimulate long-term social value. Um, so from our research, we found some interesting outcomes. So I'll go into that with you all now. So a little bit of an introduction. Um, what is placemaking? And it seems like many here are already very familiar with it. So I'll just briefly touch on the iterative process behind placemaking in that it is not linear. It is not a straight journey. It is very much a back and forth and in between jumping different steps really based on the unique context that your project is within. So for some people working on their public space project, they're going to first have to open up their municipal system to even first get permits or the, the mandate to, to get started. Whereas others in perhaps a more um, uh, uh, casual setting are able to already take short-term action right away. And you can repeat steps, go back and forth, but the most important thing is for a genuine placemaking process to include all of these steps for it to be really robust and really supported across all the different uh, inputs. And of course, for making a great place, we recognize software, hardware, and orgware. So software being the social norms, programming, events, hardware being the, the physical, physical in infrastructure, like uh, street furniture, and orgware being the organization, the coalitions, and governance structure. So why explore sustainable placemaking models? What's the reason here? And the reason is we want to take it from these acupuncture interventions or a, a placemaking project that has a start and an end into something that is very systemic, very much having a healthy basis for um, being, being valued for our time. We want to make placemaking professional, uh, more professional. And so we see here these tactical interventions that oftentimes are very much the first thing that people think about when they think of placemaking, the visual identity. So um, this wood and structure, umbrellas, murals, and how can we transition this into something that is embedded into our cities um, with placemaking professionals that have a solid job basis for the wonderful work that they do. And originally we meant to research this as business models for placemaking. And very early on in this research, we realized that's not the right terminology for us. And um, through our, our chats with different placemakers, um, both in Vienna and Oslo, and also in Europe and our partners, we realized that the idea of a business model sounds very commercial, very profit-driven, um, as you can see the definition for a business model here. So instead, uh, excuse me, well, in a business model, something that we also were critical about was that it has a um, one directional value deliver and caption, capture, um, in that the business or company delivers the value uh, as a creator and the customer, the users are the uh, receiver of that, cap that value. Um, so some things that transfer over to a sustainable placemaking model from a business model, um, they both look at creating a specific goal or end product uh, in placemaking. It's the public space being a wonderful place to be in uh, and also the, all of the amazing uh, upcycle benefits of a great community. Um, but then also looking at a specific target group, um, which stakeholders do you need to uh, approach? Um, team roles for the structure and logistics and framing a financial long-term plan. So that brings us to what is a sustainable placemaking model? We recognize a sustainable placemaking model as a framework building on the placemaking process to vitally include future-oriented organization, governance, and funding mechanisms. And really important is that this is not to seek profit as a priority, but rather as a foundation that allows us for long-term uh, social value creation among other value creations, such as environmental, educational, cultural, and economic. Um, and a little diagram below here that is a bit of an abstraction of this uh, concept is the idea of value creation. Whereas before we looked at how a um, 
a traditional business model and a business to a user uh, is unidirectional about creating value, receiving value, uh, and paying for that value uh, capture. Here in a sustainable placemaking model, we see value creation being reciprocal and co-creative. Um, and that's what we hope this uh, graphic to represent. So the place overall, um, the funding source working within that, and the users interacting between the place and the overall public sphere, and through a, a really solid foundation for a financial mechanism in your sustainable placemaking model, we see it as upcycled benefits between all co-creating aspects. Um, we recognize certain ingredients that go into a sustainable placemaking model. This is not exhaustive, but certainly a nice brainstorm from our placemaking team, uh, place, place city team, excuse me. And we recognize three approaches that go into sustainable placemaking models. Uh, that being place-led development, taking the principle of place and human scale, and the city at eye level to innovate the real estate and area development industries area management, so more looking at the programming and making sure that there is a, a mechanism for decision making uh, and long term care over the place and community development where the community members are able to come together and feel empowered to take action uh, in their space. So now from our, our research over the past uh, two years, um, we looked at some examples of what are sustainable placemaking models on the ground in Oslo and Vienna, as well as in Europe. And today I want to go into three specific ones. Um, one, uh, service, two, innovation, and three, member platform. Um, and before I jump into these, I just would like to stress that these models are not discrete. They don't operate just in a silo on their own. They're very much meant to be overlapping and combined. Uh, and further, um, again, not meant as a profit driving mechanism, really more so um, as a foundation for your placemaking project to go on for the long term. So the service sustainable model. This is seen as making a lively third place as a service. And here on the left, we have the Prinzenhag in Oslo. And it is seen as the, the backyard of Oslo city center. It has greenhouse, food trucks, bars, bunch of games, really great, wonderful place to, to go and hang out in. Really makes you feel welcomed and invited to enjoy the space. Um, that being said, of course, we don't want to uh, proliferate the commercialization of uh, public spaces. So it's very important when you do a service uh, model to make sure that it is inclusive and that uh, users don't feel like they have to pay to use it. So going on to a the next model, we have the innovation model. And this is very much a combination of different stakeholders investing into the public space. So that would be from civil society as well as um, private. So in this case, in Twain Torg, we have a, we understood from our interviews, uh, a really equitable model of the building owners, the shop renters, the community users, and the uh, municipal department. And everybody contributed into this public space, an equitable amount of capacity. So for the community members, they were able to um, bring their, their time, their energy, their opinions, their input, whereas the, the building owners, um, they were able to put in more financial uh, input. Um, and from this, everybody had um, an equitable say in, in, in shaping how the money was spent and voting really democratically about the future of the square. Um, so with this, they worked to improve the stigma and the overall appearance and brand identity of the square. That then drew in more people into the square uh, and that allowed them to then uh, leverage the square as a place to host different events. So renting it out for different parties um, or different charity events, like uh, for example, there was a fashion show, I believe. Um, and then this income went back into the square overall that they were able to hire a place manager to program the square over the year and make it really lively with that, uh, that software. 
Here we have Rampanier in Vienna. This is an example of a membership or platform sustainable placemaking model. And this is very much based on crowdfunding. Um, so you can see the, the webpage here um, where you can go online and you can see the different projects that are happening. And you can put in a, a different amount to, to work towards funding together on it, the ones that you, you feel you believe in or you wanna support. And you can also become a, a member uh, or excuse me, you can start a project or you can look for a project. Um, so to refresh or recap, the service model um, characterized by the facilitation of a lively third space. This is very common to incorporate artists. Uh, as I mentioned before, the idea of those really visually stimulating pieces of hardware in public space that does draw in a, a really quick uh, understanding from users of um, a lively place, something exciting uh, that draws your attention to want to go to. Uh, then the innovation model, very much looking at a collaboration between different stakeholders um, across all different disciplines. And then the member platform, looking at a crowdfunding model. Uh, and I'll now go into some other models that we saw in Europe in our research, but I'm not going to go in depth into each one just due to time constraints. Um, we also have the bids model, we have the advertising and marketing model, and the noteworthy of the advertising and marketing model is that that Toy and Torg example where I shared a bit about the innovative equitable structure, they also brought in advertising and marketing into the square on the, the different signs for the local businesses around, and that also gave them from, from their initial stigma promoting or changing work, that gave them then the marketing income to then also uh, pool into the place management and hiring a place manager. So again, these models can overlap and work synergistically. And the last models that I'll present here today, the landlord for renting temporary events, again, synergistically works in that innovative toy and torg uh, example that I shared. Uh, the landlord subsidizing rental costs on the ground floor. This can also be known as the secondary business model. So the idea that the owner of a building uh, allows for a lower or reduced rent on the ground floor really meant to stimulate that ground floor for the city at eye level and have those uh, interactions, um, those great experiences, opening up the plinth, the, the indoor to the outdoor uh, as a porous, a porous wall or a lack of a wall. <laughs> uh, and uh, then the, the reason why they would do this is because they see it as an investment in the overall value of the building for the long term. Uh, and again, as I stressed earlier about um, the commercialization of public space in that service model, here in the landlord subsidizing rental costs, again, it's important to keep in mind the complexity of placemaking in that Gentrification is not the, the aim for um, economic driving the value, but more so um, thinking that this is something that is locally rooted and has a place-led uh, development at its core. So it's really honor honoring the place and keeping the locals there rather than any kind of pushing out. So mm -hmm. I, will, I will leave it there. Um, and uh, if you are interested in working with us, I, I urge you to get in touch. We've been working uh, on expanding the business canvas uh, with that triple bottom line of people, planet, profit into our own version for placemaking. Uh, and this template is really meant as um, a guiding step as you go through placemaking project, not that you would do this in the in the first month of building your project and think, okay, done, I know everything that I need to do to have a, a sound financial structure and having the alliances that I need and the ways to, to build and invest, but really more so this is meant to provoke you to think about those important questions to build your placemaking process and project um, that, that hopefully makes it sustainable for the long term. Um, and as we all know, placemaking is complex. So we, we always look to improve. And if you are interested to work on this with us, we would love to hear from you. So please do get in touch. My email uh, is just right here, anna.bradley at steepo.nl. Um, and please do check out all of the wonderful work that we've do, been doing with Place City and Placemaking Europe. We're really 
proud and uh, happy to have worked all together over, the, over these last two years. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna, for your uh, really valuable presentation there uh, to help us all think about how our placemaking interventions and projects can really have long-term and far-reaching impact. Um, now we are going to move to our second uh, presentation. Uh, we'll be hearing from Ida Cortez Lopez, uh, who is a designer and co-founder of a project called uh, Nabologs Fabriken, uh, which is an initiative in Skoyen, Norway, uh, that aims to facilitate positive cooperation between residents, local business districts, uh, voluntary organizations, activists, and property developers. So let's hear now from Ida. Thank you. Let's see if I manage to do as well as everybody else in sharing my screen. Yes. So thank you for having me here. I'm so inspired. Um, there is so much I need to check and download and contact with all of you. So I will just go ahead. Thank you for having me to bring our perspective in how to involve citizens in creating inclusive, just and sustainable cities. Nabolagsfabriken uh, can be translated as the neighborhood factory. And we are on a mission to create healthy and thriving neighborhoods for everyone. So let me give you some context. Skyen is in Oslo. And this is a local initiative and Skyen is not a central a neighborhood, but the city is growing, so it feels really like one, and it's becoming more and more one. So historically, this was a place for farming and industry, and um, today Skyen is dedicated to um, office buildings, housing, and a lot of car car parking. So all the red areas in that map are car parkings, car parking. <laughs> So the area is uh, being transformed as a public transportation hub. And there is nothing wrong with this, but we believe that something is missing in this picture. And we want to inspire people to have the courage to create what is missing. We believe that Skyen, as any other neighborhood, has the potential to contribute to Oslo's sustainable transformation in many additional ways. So we embarked on this mission of a, of a healthy and thriving neighborhood, inspired by many people, many initiatives, both in Norway and abroad. People who is using their skills and knowledge, their hands and hearts to create something better. We also embarked on this mission, urge to act, um, urged by the challenges of our time and also empowered by past transformations and the fact that we all matter more than we think. So we are here in Skyen to be the change we want to see in the world. So what is that change that we want to see? We want to see places to meet and activities to do together. Activities that are that are not only connected to being consumers, but just to being citizens. The future we want to see is full of possibilities to meet other people. Just imagine the same map of your neighborhood, full of opportunities to do activities and meet others, to get to know and trust each other. And all of these possibilities should be um, available without the need for commitment or the need for hard effort from the neighbors. So what kind of activities and how do we create them? We listen to what people is missing, what they can and what they want to contribute themselves. The examples of listening activities are questionnaires, informal conversations. I forgot to say that uh, both me and Charstin, who created this initiative, we live here and we have been living here for 10 years. So we know the place and we know people. So all those informal conversations are also part of 
of what we learn and we had to go around with the mindset of listening and uh, other type of listening activities is also idea workshops with change agents so people want to be part of activities indoors during the dark winter like laura was talking about like reusing learning to repair exchanging clothes and they want to be active and social outdoors uh, when the days become longer and the weather also is better like yoga with neighbors historical tours playing shape for children or just walking and talking about what really matters for people so we empower and support change makers to get things done and here is Björk saying, I will have never organized a historical tour without the support from Nabolax Fabriken. And we need to activate and connect to people driving forces. Because we believe this is the foundation for lasting change. Okay, so all these activities contribute to informal meetings between different people from different ages and different backgrounds. And we believe that these informal meetings and conversations in everyday life are the foundation for sustainable and democratic cities. Because we live in a time when everything can be delivered home in a time where when some people has the economical resources to buy whatever activities and courses and sit in amazing cafes and then people with less resources sits home or is serving them. So we need places to acknowledge each other's existence at the same level with reciprocity and equal value because we are all interconnected and in parts of the same whole, but this is not always visible. So we also wanted to create those places and we started designing projects to build bridges between what the neighborhood needs and the future the municipality and the real estate owners are planning. We ask ourselves, how can we build the sustainable future we want already today? So in the past, we have been doing a lot of um, activities and then COVID came and we just had to close down everything. And we had the time to reflect about what is missing and about what just told you about the, the need for places. So now I'm just going to tell you about two projects very briefly that I have highlighted in blue here. So you understand a little bit more about what we are doing and how we are connecting the actors. So the first project um, comes from the need or that people is saying that skiing is really sad and is gray and uh, that they will like to see more color, more light, more nature, more culture and art in different expressions. So we, we are bringing these local needs together with five developers, Oslo Municipality and Ullern District, to bring in that color and kickstart more art and space for cultural activities, change the conversation about the neighborhood and who is being listened to. So this project now is under planning. And the second project is uh, this area is connecting the neighborhood where we live and where people work and uh, the sea. And there is a lot of conflict around this area and, and conflict about what should be built here. There are many different interests, but everybody agrees that it should be an open and inclusive space for everyone. So here we are also facilitating a conversation between all these actors. And the last project that is not connected to one specific place, it is about youth. I know you will be talking more about youth tomorrow, but I just wanted to give you the broad picture of what we are doing. And in the time when we could reflect about what is missing, of course, we noticed that we were only talking to people who could relate to us and youth could not relate. So we needed to do an extra effort. So we got financing from the Savings Bank Foundation, DNB, to create a two-year project where we are thinking um, 
more about the whole ecosystem around youth and power change agents activate the local network uh, around the youth and co-create a sustainable transition um, with the youth and the network. Yes, so this project is uh, undergoing now and we just kick-started it with the um, Leadership Academy for Youth. So we are a small team with Sharsten Bjerka and myself. Sharsten is a designer and urbanist. I am sorry, <laughs> architect and urbanist. I am the designer here. <laughs> and we are supported by many local agents, advisors and, and partners. And as architect and designer, we had many tools without, uh, with us when we started this journey. But obviously, we didn't know how the journey was going to look like. And we didn't know, or we knew we were not going to know everything. So we agreed um, on some principles that could be our compass if we got lost on our journey. So the three principles are that the neighborhood, the first one is that the neighborhood is an important resource. We want to contribute to better utilization of this capacity and involvement of the neighborhood. The second one is that everyone is welcome. We create a space for a positive collaboration between neighbors, the private, public and third sector. And I believe creating this space requires really something from us. Um, because me, just like everybody else, have to acknowledge my own biases and relearn how to be inclusive. So I think after what I've listened and what I know about you, all of us, we are transformational leaders. And that means we need to start this journey with ourselves and always act with respect, be open for new perspectives and both speak and act with compassion. In that way, we will be able to bring all these values into our initiatives. The third principle is to be results oriented. And um, we start local projects that make a difference for people and the planet. Being result oriented means for me that we need to understand the impact and act, um, be intentional. But we, this also gives us the opportunity to be flexible focusing on what we want to achieve, we can change paths when the strategies we are using are failing. So we had some tools, we had a dream, we have a compass, and then we obviously did not start all this from scratch. As I said in the beginning, we were both inspired and empowered by other initiatives and past transformations. So I wanted to bring two main insights that had shaped this project. And I hope that can also inspire your work. The first insight, and we are not experts on these fields, but the, these insights are um, really shaping how we are working. The first insight is from the field of transition design. And what I learned there is that small groups of innovators who challenge norms really matter. So don't try to understand that complicated picture and I can sell you, send you this if you want to just take contact with me. Um, but it's about even if what we are doing is really small actions, it's really pushing the system we are a part of. So we just have to keep, um, keep going and keep working deeply. So we really push the system. And the second insight is that uh, when it comes to people participating is that beliefs matter. If people go around thinking, I don't believe I matter, then no matter how easy we make it to, to participate, they will never join. So to finish, I would like to share with you a quote from Shuhini Ghosh, who is um, working with quantum physics. And she says, nature has shown us that you can take the smallest amounts, trace elements of matter, and they can actually make huge impacts and change the planet. So can we be those trace elements and make tiny, tiny actions that collectively change the world? 
thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Ida, for that inspiration from Skoyen. Um, we're going to move quickly now uh, to Stephanie Degenhardt, who also has a uh, inspirational example for us from Oslo. Stephanie is the coordinator of research on urban agriculture for the Agency for Urban Environment of Oslo Municipality. She's going to tell us a little about a community garden project at an old farm here in Oslo called Linderugor, where multiple actors have come together around food. So I'll hand it to Stephanie. Yes, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the inspiring presentations you had so far. It was really nice listening to. Let me just uh, get everything ready. I need to move you. All right, great. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Adam. Um, I think we heard a bit about Oslo, so let's see how much I'm going to dive into that. But uh, um, yeah, as Adam said, I'm working for the city of Oslo, the Agency for Urban Environment, and particularly with uh, urban agriculture and the community garden uh, at Linderud, which we have um, started there. Um, but I think a bit about the surrounding. So uh, Oslo, the capital of Norway, we have about 700,000 uh, inhabitants, and it's considered one of the fastest growing cities in, uh, in Europe. Uh, the reason I say that, because um, it's important to think about city development for Oslo. We are surrounded by the fjord on the one side and a national park, the forest on the other side. So which means the city can't expand uh, outwards, but it has to expand from within. So that means there is a high pressure on already existing areas, existing green areas, especially. And um, yes, yeah. So just I just wanted to say that to be that in mind. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention, which might be interesting in that context, is that um, Oslo is considered historically considered to be divided in a poorer, e poorer east and the wealthier uh, west. Um, this is still visible today, for example, nine out of, out of the 10 richest suburbs in Oslo are situated in the West, whereas uh, 10 of the districts with um, the highest rate of households with low income are situated in the East. So a bit about the, this background, the area I'm talking about is situated in the East of Oslo, I can show you in the next slide. As you can see, I'm not a graphic designer, so I apologize for my poor <laughs> design here. Um, but you can see down here in the left, this is the shape of Oslo. This is the shape we will probably going to have forever. Um, the farm I want to talk about is here. And um, I'm saying that because it is situated in a, uh, an area which is marked by numerous complex social and health problems, which are linked to inequality, to social exclusion, to dependencies on social welfare, poverty, and it is a degraded urban environment. And due to these reasons, this area undergoes an urban renewal program, which already started, it's actually the whole east here, which already started in 2007. But uh, for the past four years now has concentrated particularly on neighborhood development. Um, uh, yeah, and in, yeah, neighborhood development, increasing identity and reducing the number of high school dropouts, actually. So this community garden um, placed so nicely here. This is part of a farm. And it is so surrounded by a big shopping center, by uh, different schools, elementary schools, and um, uh, high school. <laughs> uh, kindergarten it has new developments on one side. It has, a, I don't have marked this, it has some public transport, the metro down here. And it has a lot of high rise apartment blocks um, uh, all over here, spanning here. Um, so uh, let me see. Yes. So the oops, I went too far. So the reason I am presenting uh, this farm here, uh, this today, because the farm uh, I should not mention that, which is called Linderit Farm, is privately owned, but it is run by a museum, and. 
the farm was previously closed to the public, but since the museum took over about five, six years ago, the farm has literally opened its gates for the surrounding neighborhood. And it now works together with the local city district and the urban renewal program to make it an integrated part of the local community. Um, and I am presenting this to here today because Oslo, the municipality, is participating in a research innovation project called Edible Cities Networks. And the aim of this uh, project is to make cities more livable, greener, healthier through uh, collaboration and learning, in particular through urban agriculture. And we have together, uh, we when I, when I say we, I talk about us, the city, together with the museum that is running the farm, museum uh, in Akasius, uh, the Nabulak Saga, who are holding the symposium today, uh, and several other local initiatives and local citizens. We have co-created this uh, community garden. And let me see. Yeah, we had when we started this, our main goal was to use urban agriculture as a resource for building community, for improving participation amongst the different groups and uh, the ownership over the area, uh, which we hope will lead to a higher social inclusion. And we also wanted to connect to the local cultural heritage, because I think um, someone before me mentioned that already, Oslo used to be an agricultural city, so everything I just go up here. Everything you see here in uh, back in the 60s even was all farmland. So it has changed a lot since then. Um, yeah, and we also want to empower citizens to, to come together to create their own space to learn from each other. And ideally, we also want to help to create uh, businesses. We're looking at entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship in particular. But um, Let's see, am I too far? Not here. So what is a community garden? For those who don't know, um, it's, a uh, it's a place where different groups can meet together to grow food and community together. It's very important. Uh, the Linderit Community Garden is a social meeting place uh, for the local community for uh, overall. It's also a place for different generations and different nationalities uh, to meet and also for people from different uh, social backgrounds to come together and meet their neighbors. And it's also the area for growing food and relationships and a place to learn, exchange knowledge and to give opportunities to grow businesses. So we have uh, started in late 2019, actually in 2020, I should say, with the long winter. Um, so since 2020, we have engaged a lot of initiatives and uh, uh, community groups and networks in here. I can just mention some. There were some social entrepreneurs who have an area to grow uh, their project, but they also give courses and a traineeship to everyone else who wants to. So they have regular courses. We have um, a work training that different groups involved. From example, from the we have a summer school program, a summer jobs program, with the local schools, uh, but also youth from from a bit further away, uh, also together with Nabalak Saga, where we uh, yeah employ youth to help us create this farm, but they also get their first experience and they can expand, grow their own business, and uh, I can I'll talk a bit about this later. We've started an incubator program for sustainable food production, which is kind of a mentorship where people receive both training and an area to grow their businesses. Uh, we have worked together with the uh, um, botanical garden to create a wild flower meadow to increase um, biodiversity. We have we try to build community uh, and education, so we invite in the schools, <coughs> excuse me, to to plant uh, to use it as a school garden to plant something to connect to hang out to have the green education in that area. And we have also built a social meeting place. This is especially the youth in the summer job who were very engaged in that um, through different participatory meetings and um, building workshops. Uh, we have tried to engage all the local community because we want them to use that place uh, as, as the newly found green oasis in an otherwise relatively gray and asphalted area. Um, and there's a, a big 
community-supported agriculture that has started here, which engages 60 local members in growing their food here. Uh, yes. I'm, uh, I'm kind of rushing through it. I hope that's fine. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is this sustainability. We, well, yeah, the question is what makes this uh, project sustainable? It was uh, very inspiring to listen to your uh, presentation, Anna, uh, trying to figure out where we are. So it'd be really interesting to think a bit further. I think we are more in the innovation part maybe because we are, um, we are a co we have co-created this place with everyone. It's a uh, we really tried to create ownership on the ground level by involving the local community through these participatory workshops. Um, even though the municipality is part of the project, it is also local business and local initiative. There's a local network, for example, the um, uh, mothers districts network, which connect local uh, mothers with my uh, my different backgrounds. Um, they, they are part of the group uh, and the youth, I think are very important because they're local youth, they go to the neighboring school. Uh, a lot of people who are now engaged know the farm only with a big fence around. So this is really nice to see that people are more engaged now and, and, and taking part. And I think this point of creating this, this ownership, people go there on their own. We have particularly seen this now in uh, COVID last year, where we were not really allowed to have any um, big events uh, as we usually have. But people just got together and uh, they just used this area to go for their daily walk or to meet in smaller groups to do some planting or, or watering of the garden. So it gives people a really good uh, excuse <laughs> to go there. And one of the feedback, which is quite interesting from the youth also was that they came to this garden through the summer jobs, but they stayed even after the summer jobs because they um, felt that now they have a, a reason to be there. The, the summer jobs provided the first, uh, the first step, but now they had a reason to be there. They could just go there, hang out, do their homework after school, and uh, that was really nice to see. And some of them even uh, engaged voluntarily after even not getting paid anymore. Uh, let me just see if that I don't forget anything. Yes, uh, here are some uh, pictures. We have, uh, I think this um, smoothie bicycle you've seen already before. It's from Napolak a very effective tool. Uh, we have build this meeting place, first of all, temporary, because first we had a planning workshop where people could come and write down their ideas, what it is they like about the place, what they need. And it was to use who built this workshop with a straw bale or hay bales, as you can see the ready-made place and there's a party going on in the background. So it has been very, very popular. We've also built uh, other tools, other, other benches um, and things to sit on. We continue that work this year as well. And um, let me see if I have this on the next one. Yes. Another thing I wanted to mention to the topic of sustainability is the collaboration for long-term impact between the municipality and the museum. I think this is uh, very important. We started this project through Edible City Networks. So we got EU funding to uh, get it going. But we also have made a contract with the uh, museum and the local city district. So yeah, I'm, not in, I'm not from the local city district, I'm uh, from the whole city. But we have engaged the local city district, which is responsible for the urban renewal program and uh, made a contract for five years that all engage, where we all have set the same goals to develop this place as a resource for the local environment, uh, for the local community. And um, we also seek to, we, we have some funding to start with, but we have also diversified the funding. So we have applied for a lot of private or public grant schemes, and uh, it has become a part of the urban renewal program. So there's also funding coming from this side to expand and the museum is very interested in keeping the place alive uh, by using it and they're very interested in uh, connecting into the community uh, to the, the neighborhood so a plan we do 
this year is we want to physically expand the location because so this is the farm as it is uh, right now with all the different actors who have an area and a social meeting place and the social garden it's for everyone um, and when you see the uh, on the right side where you see the, the farm is only here it's about 8,000 square meters um, this is the whole farm and we want to create a na nature path or an edible um, school path where we have taken away the uh, gates, uh, not the gates, the fences here and made a gate here. So it's now very easy to, for everyone who lives on this side to act, to go in here. Um, we want to plant more edible plants along the way here and along the gate so people can also engage from inside and outside. We want to make it more accessible for people who so we have made a street here we want to make it accessible for people who sit in a wheelchair, for example. And uh, we also make a better connection in this direction towards the shopping center I mentioned earlier, uh, because there is a new meeting place of the city, the urban renewal program is working with here. So we want to have a very visual connection between these two. Plus, we want people to be able to go through the schools and basically, if they want to go on the round, to go through Linderit, through our farm, instead of as it previously has been done, is around, which is all the way up here, down here, and down the, the um, path. Yes, I think that's it from me. The, um, some more uh, pictures from what happened last year, the workshops, the youth that had started to uh, sell cakes and the products they have grown at the farm, uh, some uh, markets we have held where a lot of people came. And uh, this is one of the entrepreneurs who have started to grow uh, flowers at the farm, which she's selling at all the different uh, markets and events we have. Yes, yeah, no, and one thing I wanted to mention also, we, um, uh, through all these events we are holding, we tried to, no, we have, no, sorry, we have held a lot of, we have an opening uh, event, we have uh, summer parties, for example, we engage in open days, which we have once a week, and we also had like a, a treasure hunt, uh, where we first wanted to get people into the farm, because it was very new for them, and I think all these tools, or most of these tools, you can also find in the handbook that is developed by, uh, which Laura mentioned earlier, Benabulaksaga. Yes, now I'm done. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, really nice to see such a organic kind of grassroots project kind of grow based on the, the needs and desires of all the stakeholders together. Um, so we're excited to see it grow. Uh, this season uh, here in Oslo. Uh, finally, uh, we have about 12 minutes left in our time together today. Uh, we are going to hear from Anna Bradley again. Um, she's going to tell us about an upcoming festival, the After COVID City Festival, uh, which is going to celebrate social proximity in times of physical distance and reclaim the roles of cities, uh, places, and people to shape a post-COVID world for the better. So I will turn it over to Anna. Yes, thank you, Adam. So I'm going to put on my, my different hat here now, uh, representing the After COVID City Initiative that is powered by Placemaking Europe and the city of Barcelona, and also um, inclusively open to, to other ways for our network, for interested people, organizations, cities to get involved and join us. So Adam, as Adam mentioned, it is all about public space for recovery. We can all relate and recognize the huge impact that the pandemic has had on all of our lives. So now we're really looking to the future. How can we turn this challenge into something that we can learn and grow from for the better? Um, we do have a festival happening September 15th through the 17th. And this festival will be a, a, a dispersed festival, both digitally and also with hyper-local events. So um, you can have um, all different ways to get involved there. I'll go into a little bit about the program here. Um, we'll have um, some roundtable talks, uh, debates, discussions, 
um, really building the momentum between now and then, as well as on the, the September 15th moment. On September 16th, the main day, it will be all about uh, sessions that really mirror the routine and daily life in the city, starting with how do you wake up and commute to work in the morning? How do you access your social amenities and your recreation through the day? How do you enjoy nightlife and the vibrant city in the evening? Um, and on the 17th, we'll be having a really exciting co-creation charter workshop all about um, uh, what do we need for a city uh, after COVID. And this can be made by your, your local uh, group in your city, specific to your context. And then we aim to coalesce all of these really important vital ideas into one common collective charter about how our after COVID city should look. Um, and just a little bit of a timeline here for you. So right now we are in the build up moment where we're building the program further. Um, we have a survey ongoing. So we really see this not only as a festival, but very much as an initiative of our whole network and community to get behind. So we really um, motivate you to take that survey and it will be a really great open source uh, knowledge base for us to learn from about how have our cities changed in, in, uh, in the results we hear from you. Uh, and then the ways that you can get involved. We would absolutely love, love, love for you to be on board. So you can become uh, a partner city all the way to um, watching and participating on your computer. But the other ways as well are share a great story that you really believe in to be included in the program, joining in in that co-creative charter workshop on the, the September 17th, um, organizing a local watch party that could be you and your your group of placemaking friends of 10 people, two people, or it could be the organization that you work with wanting to host uh, at a venue. Um, it's really up to how you feel that you want to get involved. And then, of course, we are really excited to test tac tactical tools, um, both in host cities that are on, on board as partners and also uh, distributed out to the whole network to, to share and test together. And uh, we're really hopeful and looking forward to this moment because we see the, the hopeful moments of opening public space back up. And um, as we're, we're here digitally today, we do see this as a great moment to have these really sensitively hyper-local events while also making it very digitally inclusive for the wider community. And um, so I will now uh, pass it back to Adam and thank you very much for letting me speak about this. Yeah, thanks so much, Anna. Um, I think we have a really unique opportunity as our cities begin to reopen and as we are able to kind of take back public space uh, within the cities together um, to, to reform that space, to reimagine that space, to, to uh, take the good that has come from this uh, these lockdowns and this pandemic um, and really kind of make that more permanent. Um, so a really exciting time as things begin to reopen and a really important time to start thinking uh, about public space. So we really hope we will see all of you at the After City COVID conference. You can see in the chat uh, the link uh, to the conference if you want to get involved, if you want to set up some watch parties or, or the like, like Anna was talking about. Um, if, uh, Laura, do we have anything else? I don't think we really have enough time for a panel discussion, uh, but we're happy to take uh, any questions if there are any, mm. um, if people will put those in the chat. Um, while we are doing that, uh, can we also cover, can someone tell us all where to find all the resources we have heard about today, all the wonderful things to download and manuals and such? Maybe Anna, will you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm back. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, on the Placemaking Europe website, you can access, I'd, I'd say, 75% of the links that have been shared in the, the chat. So I will put the, the main um, Placemaking Europe website there for you. And um, it's really exciting on our website that we built through Place City Project and with our partners. We have um, stories, activities, tools, so you can really browse around and get inspired. 
Um, and then you can also access our different uh, partners that we have um, in Place City there that then branch out to their respective uh, websites. Um, and if I if I missed anything, everybody else, please speak up. I don't want to speak for everyone. And I see actually a question for you uh, that's popped up in the chat from Stephanie. She would be very happy to hear more about the sustainability aspect yeah. you presented. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, because sustainability is a, a hot topic word and one that is often thrown around really frequently. So for us, we see the idea of uh, sustainability in placemaking as one in the same because we feel that if you are doing a genuine placemaking process, it's going to involve the locals, it's going to think long term, it's going to be sensitive, um, it's going to be experimental with your, your tactical interventions to really understand what is the best long-term decision. Uh, and so for us, a placemaking model, we see it as sustainable because it's meant as a long-term mechanism for a foundational structure. Um, so the idea, per, perhaps, for example, the entrepreneur that you, you mentioned um, uh, using the farm to grow flowers and sell the flowers at the market, um, perhaps she, she forms a model that's an innovative model, a, collabor a collective model between the city, uh, the farm, herself, and maybe other community members, where she has this resource and she she's able to sell it. And that money, then she's able to set up a certain ratio that she is happy to invest and give back to the farm, to put back into a public space. Um, and then that in turn helps her become more recognized as somebody that's a local social entrepreneur in the area where people want to keep coming back to her for their, their flowers because they do know that it is uh, a local, uh, local social entrepreneur and that they feel that it's a responsible decision. Um, and, and in terms of the overall idea of placemaking, um, really making sure that you include all of those uh, steps that we we touched on in the 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 wheel because if you miss one we really do feel that it isn't robust enough and that it won't uh, give you enough for the long term overall um, of course you can do it contextually in in any ratio of those steps as needed but really it is important to include include your municipal system, which I'm sure you can absolutely relate to. Um, and getting to know your community, doing that research on the ground floor, engaging the community, the short-term action, programming, um, getting in, involved with the real estate and investors for the, the new area development, um, having that financial model that I just spoke about, um, and um, bringing, bringing the city at eye level. The, the plinth idea to your streets for great experiences. Um, but I'd love to chat more with you. So um, let's connect and stay in touch. Yeah, maybe as a final question in our last two minutes or so, we can direct maybe to Roland um, an adaptation of Ida's question. Um, what kind of is the biggest challenge you faced, especially there in Vienna, um, be it cultural, social, regulatory, um, what was that big challenge and how did you overcome it? Well, in placemaking, there are a lot of traveling ideas of international practices that you see somewhere and you try to replicate in your, in your local project. And what we, what we found out is <clears throat> a, a placemaking project mm -hmm. can easily fail. Uh, and we saw that in our framework that uh, students uh, implemented a, a, a parklet and without listening to the people that, uh, well, in our area, there are no hipsters and there are no, I mean, there is a totally different uh, uh, range of people, sort of people there. And um, I think that the, this local place, uh, this, this place makers didn't listen to them and uh, it was, um, yeah, it was not accepted at all. So there was a big shitstorm on the local press. Everybody was against it. And I was very sorry for these young people that they did a lot of effort and they, they, they failed. And, uh, and, and we, we, but we learned from that. Uh, so we had a very sensitive approach. We listened to the community and uh, 
all we implement is done uh, through the community. So there is nothing from outside. It's everything is from inside, and the and the, the and the owner of the of the intervention is the local library. So so we make sure that this uh, placemaking model is quite just, uh, sustainable, and uh, we 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 started something that will be durable and and will 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 be maintained. Thanks so much, Roland. Um, and as our time comes to an end, I just want to say uh, thanks again to everyone who spoke here today. A special thank you to Placemaking Europe for all of their help in organizing today. Um, we can all connect on the Placemaking Europe website, uh, as well as Facebook and through other means such as email. Um, so we look forward to that. Um, and from those of us at Nablog Sager, uh, I would just like to say, um, keep on. Let's all keep changing our cities and making them better. Um, so see everyone in a different space later on. Bye. <laughs>